Thank you for joining us with Mass Live. Uh, we're here doing a roundtable on veterans' issues. Um, so there are 380,000 veterans in Massachusetts. Uh, they're a group that has different needs in the general population, and to which the government has special moral and legal obligations. So I'm Dan Glon with Mass Live, and I'm here today with three advocates for veterans' issues in the state. Uh, we have Representative John Vilas, Town of Ludlow Director of Veterans Services Eric Segundo, and Senator Eric Lesser. Um, so what we're going to do is just talk about a bunch of the issues that are facing veterans and how local and state authorities are trying to get them through it and help them out. Um, so to start off, let's do some introductions. Uh, so if you want to tell us a little bit about how you each got involved with Veterans Affairs, um, what your personal connection to this issue is. Uh, Representative Felis, I know, you know you're an active duty captain, so why don't you start us off? Yeah, I mean, it's an easy cause to get involved with. Um, obviously, we're dealing with a country right now with less than 1% of our country you know, volunteer, it's an all-volunteer force, so obviously it's something that we need to do to pay respect, um, and it's just, obviously it's easier. I am a veteran, I'm still, in, still a captain of the U.S. Army Reserves, and it's just something that as long as I'm in elected office and outside of it, will continue to be an advocate for. Currently, obviously, I'm a state representative for the 4th Hamden District and the vice chairman of the Veterans and Federal Affairs Committee. Uh, Mr. Segundo? Uh, Eric Segundo, uh, Director of Veterans Services. Uh, I've been doing it about four years, uh, a little over four years. Um, I served on active duty four and a half years with a, a deployment to Iraq and uh, returning home I moved back to Massachusetts and I got roadblocks. Uh, I researched, I went online, I saw all these different benefits and then when I went to my local uh, agent it was a totally different story or different uh, situations that they were describing than what I read. Um, so I, I did what I needed to do but I, I investigated more and found out that it was inaccurate or it wasn't uh, and that's how I got involved into veteran services I felt that returning veterans there had to be a better way a better system and and, and education behind it um, so Senator Lester you actually wrote this week and <coughs> about uh, your family's relationship to armed services so tell us a little bit about that yeah so first thanks for having us and for hosting this I, I really want to give a, a special thank you to um, you know to state rep Vilas and to Eric Segundo um, you know two of the best we're actually lucky two of the best uh, and most effective veterans advocates in the whole state live right here uh, in Western Massachusetts so we're, we're, we're lucky to have that proximity uh, to such good advocates uh, for me it was uh, personal it was my dad um, he was not in the military for most of his life uh, he actually joined in his mid-50s uh, he's a doctor in Holyoke one of his patients uh, told him about the shortage of doctors in the National Guard in particular but it's actually an issue with the whole military and um, and so he signed up and joined later in life uh, and served a brief tour in Iraq uh, for doctors. The, um, the tour is a little bit shorter, but um, since then has been, uh, has been very uh, active in guard issues. And just listening to him and seeing his story and meeting some of his friends and the people he's worked with uh, you know, from his time in the guard, I've, I've just become sensitive to the issue. And you know, I'd say a point about you know, John and I, uh, um, you know, both also do a lot of work around millennial issues and young, um, you know, uh, you know, issues among young people, our generation in state government, and we actually have a big issue with young veterans uh, and a big, a large number of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. I think often, when the public had traditionally thought of veterans' issues, they thought of World War II generation or Vietnam. Those are certainly important, um, uh, important groups and, and generations to focus on. But we do now have a big and growing cohort of young veterans, uh, people in their 20s, 30s, who come, who came out of Iraq, Afghanistan, global war and terror. And I think um, you know, that population in particular does, does merit uh, some important consideration. Um, so this year, the Rand Corporation put out a study on the welfare of veterans, specifically in Massachusetts. They surveyed about 900 vets, as well as active National Guard and Reserve members. Um, so let's start off with some of the good news in this report, which found that veterans in Massachusetts are in some ways better off than those in other states. They're more likely to have a college degree, they have higher incomes, they're more likely to have health insurance. Um, so I mean, do you think that Massachusetts is like setting the standard for the country? Is, is this you know, the best system out there as far as the 50 states? Is there room for improvement? Uh, so we can start with you, Rick. There's always room for improvement. Um, we constantly have to. One of the things would be Afghan and Iraqi, really the war on terror veterans, is that there are so many issues that we didn't necessarily experience with previous conflicts. One of the biggest issues with veterans, I would argue, obviously, you have the employment, the unemployment numbers, but then you also have the underemployment of veterans. Veterans, I, it pains me, the number of veterans that come into my office 
battle hardened, had all this responsibility, platoon sergeants, captains, you know, cap company commanders. And then they come back here and they're getting jobs doing something that falls measurably below what they're capable of. So we have getting them jobs in obviously the OIF and the OEF veterans, Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, their employment numbers are less than they should be. I mean, it's higher than it should be right now, but the underemployment and a lot of that responsibility, I have to be candid with you, it lays in the civilian world, but also in the military. We need to do a better job transitioning from the military to the civilian world. It's that transition that we really need to get down. What's your take on how Massachusetts is doing it? You know, Massachusetts, I lived in other states when I was in the service and coming home here. Uh, the, the benefits are there. Uh, the services are there. Um, and like uh, Rep. Vila says, that there's always room for improvements. Uh, you know, every city and town of Massachusetts is required by regulation, by law, that they have a veteran service agent. Uh, do they all do? No. Can I give you a list of those that don't? Absolutely. Cause they, they, and I'll give them to, to the rep when we leave here today. Um, and, and the reason why is because that's the first stop for our veterans when they come home, is they should be seeing the veteran service agent in their town to get assistance, whether it's through employment, assistance, benefits, uh, the financial assistance portion of 115, Chapter 115. If a, a veteran is, is financially in, in, in strays, uh, leaving the military and no income, that program is there to assist them with financial and medical needs while they get back on their feet. So having, again, a veteran agent in every city and town as, as the law dictates to provide these benefits is key in the transition. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, Massachusetts in many ways does lead the way in veteran services. Uh, you know, Eric's exactly great. And, and by the way, Eric's work at Ludlow, which is one of the communities I represent, is, is, is Exhibit A for, um, you know, how an effective VSO, veteran service uh, officer structure works. Um, everyone in the community knows um, to turn to him uh, if, they, if they have an issue or they need to get access to services. And we need to make sure that that gets replicated in all 351 communities. Uh, one thing that is unique, I do think, is, you know, as uh, Rep. Vilas pointed out, to Iraq and Afghanistan veterans is both because of the length of those conflicts and the intensity and the nature of the experiences a lot of our, um, uh, our um, service members faced when they were over there. There are some very acute and often um, unmet needs, and there's a lot of stigma uh, around sometimes getting those veterans the help they need, in particular mental health uh, services. We've done some work on, on uh, post-traumatic stress, uh, for example. I think we all need to do a better job as a society of giving our veterans the space um, to talk about that and to feel comfortable coming forward. And, um, you know, I'm glad that we brought up the item of employment because uh, we do have an issue, and John's absolutely right, you know, you have uh, veterans that had incredible and very intense experiences that are very relevant to private sector challenges, team building, leadership under pressure. I mean, these are all buzzwords that you hear in the corporate world all the time. Uh, we need to do a better job of making sure uh, that those skills can transfer over. Uh, and so that's a, a, a big unmet challenge that we, that as policymakers we need to focus on. So yeah, let's dive into veterans employment a little bit more. Um, so the RAND study that I was talking about found that the most common barriers to employment in Massachusetts were not having the right experience or skills, as well as you know health limitations in child care. Um, so Rep. Vilas, you've introduced a bill that would strengthen preference in veterans hiring. Uh, so tell us like what would be involved in that and why that's necessary in the state. So right now, throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, cities and towns are pulling out of civil service. Um, it, and it's a growing trend, and I'm not gonna get into the- Sorry, explain what you mean by pulling out of civil okay, service. Okay, so essentially what happens is that if a, a city council, et cetera, you know, the local government decides that civil service, for any number of reasons, no longer wants to be a part of that. Obviously, there's hiring practices and exam, et cetera, for civil service, and they're pulling out, and it's a growing trend. So what happens with that, you're kind of going back to the day where police chiefs, et cetera, can handpick who they want to hire. Right now, the civil, ser civil service system that's in place has what's called a veteran's preference. Um, when a city or town pulls out of that, what's happening is that they're not hiring veterans from the cities and towns that have pulled out right now. What we know with absolute certainty is they're not hiring veterans at the same rate that they were before, particularly in the realm of public safety which happens to coincide with areas where veterans possess a lot of those requisite skill sets, police and fire. So I filed a bill, and Senator Lesser is a co-sponsor. If, if you pull out of civil service in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we are still going to mandate that you have veterans preference. And again, I don't want to be redundant, but it's going back to that 
less than 1% of our country raises their right hand to fight for this country right now. To pull out of civil service and to hurt a veteran doesn't make sense. And if you are going to pull out of civil service, and a lot of cities and towns to do that for reasons having nothing to do with getting out of the veterans' preference. But if you are going to pull out, we still want to ensure that our veterans have that chance. And there's a lot of co-sponsors to the bill, and we'll see what happens. And so we're talking about positions like firefighters Correct. or police officers where you know veterans already have firearms training, they already have first aid training. Uh, so some of, of the best police officers and firefighters, if you talk to them, if you had this in, in this room right here right now and ask them you know, why they excel at their jobs, I would pretty much guarantee you that nine out of ten of them are going to say some of the skills they learned in the military. And I'm glad you brought up the police officers in particular, because actually we, um, this was maybe a year or so ago, but we had a, a um, forum that John hosted at Westfield State uh, for, again, for young, for millennial veterans. And actually, uh, uh, there was someone there who brought up the fact that he had gotten military police training yeah. over, you know, while he was in, served overseas as a military police officer with the military. And when he came back, he had to jump through all these crazy hoops uh, and, um, and, and bureaucratic steps for the uh, police academies to credit the training that he'd already received as a military police officer. So that's like low-hanging fruit that we should be able to you know, identify and get fixed as quickly as possible. I mean, the civil service reforms are essential, um, and you know, and they, they need to be done. Um, you know, they need to be done together. Because I, I remember listening to a nice guy, and he was uh, explaining. You know, just he had served his country overseas as a military police officer. He wanted to come back and continue to serve his community as a police officer. The taxpayer had already invested a lot of money in getting him trained to be a military police officer. Why would you replicate all that and make it as hard as possible? Um, to transition that into civilian policing. So, Senator, you've worked a lot on general like job training issues. Um, like you, you know, secured funding for some of these programs. You talk a lot about manufacturing. Uh, how can those programs be better targeted at ensuring that both like veterans are aware of them and that they have access to them? Yeah. Well, Eric would can probably chime in on that because he, he this is his wheelhouse. But um, you know, I would say two things. One is you know a rising tide does lift all boats, uh, and if our overall economy in Western Mass is not doing well, that's not good for veterans. It's not good for anyone. So we do have to make, be focused on how we broadly improve the economy for everyone in all sectors, and that will obviously help all all people. But there are specific items uh, that are very unique to the veterans community. You know, one is certainly access to services. You know, the, the, our state is generous. We, we want to step up, we want to help people who are coming back from overseas, but it doesn't do much good if we make these programs available, if we cast these votes on these programs, dedicate the funds, and then the, the, the vets don't know how to, how to get a hold of them. So we do need to improve that. And then the other item is, uh, you know, these crosswalk issues, which we've talked about a lot and all of us have worked on. Which is, you know, transferability again, you know, as, as, as Rev Vilas brought up, this is so important transferability of, of skills. So I'll give you like machining, for example. Just this morning I was in, up in Shelburne for a meeting of a group of Western Mass uh, business owners who are desperate for employees in, in items like precision grinding, you know, precision mach machining, CAD CAM operating, um, CNC machine, you know, CNC machining. There's actually a lot of people in the military that do those skills. I was thinking my grandfather, who was in the Navy, uh, learned how to be a tool and die maker while he was in the Navy, came back uh, and spent a 40-year career as a tool and die maker based off the skills he learned in the Navy. So we need to do a better job of connecting those private sector employers with the government, with the military, and with the vets. So that's just a good idea. Yes, and I, I agree that there's so many uh, different uh, obstacles in the way of, of connecting those those skill sets with local jobs and, and local uh, organizations. I know that there's been some strides and the federal side is making some strides in trying to, uh, you know, uh, correlate or, or have their, their skill sets match up uh, and give credit. So if they, you know, if they were a truck driver in, in, in combat, that they come home and they can just transfer their driving record and get their license instead of taking tests. Again, but the, the, the system is too slow. It's not moving fast enough for the veteran. The veteran comes home, he needs a job today. He can't wait six months for a law to pass or some, some, something that, that, that enables him to get the upper step. And, and that's where the veteran's preference comes in as well, where it needs to, to be in place. Uh, we're fortunate in Western Mass, uh, the Career Center and, and Veterans Inc. have uh, dedicated uh, services to, just for veterans, employment hiring, skill sets, resume writing, that the services are there, again, 
the VSO directs the veteran to, to, that, to that agency right here in Springfield and, and connects the veteran. Uh, lastly, the one I want to add to that is that uh, I know that there are tax breaks that are being allowed to businesses now that hire veterans. Uh, so there are many companies out there that need to hire. You hire a veteran, get a tax break on, on that as well. Um, that's another way to get the, uh, the, the businesses involved in, in, in hiring highly skilled individuals, dedicated, committed, you know, uh, fully trained, uh, and, and they can move forward. Just briefly, there's been a lot of, in the past that's been done for veteran-owned businesses, but to Eric's point, we need to ask more of our employers. And Governor Baker, I think to his credit in the state of the Commonwealth, talked about a tax credit, a $4,000 tax credit. There is that in the House budget to survive the House. But we need to incentivize employers. It exists at the federal level, but we need to do that at the state level because not every veteran is going to own a business. We need to incentivize them to hire a veteran, to retain them, but also to train them. So that, that a lot of the onus, in my opinion, is on the employer as well. Um, so since you mentioned the budget, um, you know, over the last few weeks we've gotten news that the tax receipts are lower than expected. The economy has in Massachusetts has is not performing as well as it had been over the last like, year or two years. Um, so the funding for these programs, since you guys are in budget talks now, like, is it safe? Is there any potential for increases, or is is the financial state of the Commonwealth sort of putting a crunch on what we can do for these veterans? So we're right in the middle of budget season. This is a yeah. good day. Yeah, I'll take a crack at it because we're the Senate is voting next week. Uh, the House just just finished. But um, so the short answer is, you know, it always requires advocacy. You know, nothing is ever a slam dunk. I mean, that's part of the reason why we're doing this forum to be perfectly. Blunt, you know, we we're only as effective as our communities are in in, um, in mobilizing and, and and organizing. So um, you know, so that no, no one should ever take anything for granted. Is is my point? Is that we every year it's it's a struggle and it's a, and it's an organiz and it's, you require organization. So that's a given. I would say that um, there are some concerns about the budget picture right now, but. I think every I can't speak for everyone, but I think the vast majority of uh, of um, of our of our caucus in the Senate and I'm sure in the House as well wants to do everything they can to preserve veterans programs, and that will will be among the last things that would ever be cut. Uh, well, you know, when you face a tight budget picture, you really you, you you have to take a take an approach of like just what is the most essential, and you build out from that. And you know, obviously, I think all of us would certainly argue, and we would. Be forceful advocates for the fact that even in a tough budget time, the commitment we make to our veterans is a sacred commitment. It goes beyond dollars and cents. It, uh, it really touches the fabric of our country and of our democratic system. That you need uh, people uh, able to bear the burden, and then they come home and the community rallies around to support them. So I think that will remain absolutely essential. And I'll tell you that um, you know the the tax credit that that is being discussed for businesses is. It sailed through the House, it will sail through the Senate uh, as well, and has broad bipartisan support. And in fact, there's actually been discussion about expanding it a little, uh, even beyond uh, even beyond what the governor had proposed. Uh, so uh, people are, are right to be cautious, and they should be, and they should be on alert. Uh, but um, but I, I do think that they can have some confidence in the fact that this is a kind of basic core value of who we are as a state, who we are as a country, and it's, 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 we're going to do everything we can to protect it. I guess what I would add to that, and I agree with everything the senator said, is I mean, how can you not? I mean, when we're talking about veterans, I mean, all of the other very, very important things that we deal with, obviously, the OP. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But the way that I like to describe it, and anytime I'm advocating for a veterans program with my leadership on the House side, is it's listen, you can talk all you want about all this other stuff, but if you take away the sacrifice of these veterans, none of this is possible. None of it, zero. So it, when you make the argument, like that, and you really kind of get people thinking about what precisely they do, the fact that we've been a nation at war for approaching 20 years now. Over and over again, our service members are being asked to go overseas, et cetera. And I gotta be honest with you, anybody who's following the news right now knows that that might not be ending anytime soon. So how, how can we not do everything in our power and how can it not be preserved in the budget? It, and it also means, you know, as, uh, as we talked about a little bit earlier and to Eric's point when we were opening this, you know, this is also when we got to make sure that these programs are operating as efficiently as possible. Um, because we, we all talk about this. I mean, we, we get calls to our office. Eric gets calls to his office, um, you know, from vets who 
it's like you see the program, you, you see the building where the program's administ administered or the benefit, or you read okay. about it, you can't get it, and you can't, yeah, and you can't figure out how to make it work. So we have an obligation also when times get tough, uh, I mean, always, but certainly when times get tough to make sure, okay, let's double down on what we have, let's make sure it's as efficient as possible, it's helping as many people as possible, and, um, and, uh, and it's getting the biggest impact it can. So, uh, Mr. Scandu, that is something I wanted to ask you about. Um, that report I was talking about found that a significant number of veterans, particularly current National Guard and Reserve members, had need of services but didn't get them either because they didn't know about them at all or didn't know that they were eligible. So is that something you've seen? Is it is like is there a need for more outreach? Like how how many veterans are we sort of missing just by virtue of them not knowing what is available to them? Right. Um, yes. Um, not being able to find services one. Uh, can be challenging. Two is uh, not knowing that they're available for it um, or not aware of it. And then three is not qualifying for it because of the different uh, class classifications on what the state of Massachusetts considers a veteran. And, and uh, But as we know that any veteran who serves over 180 days of active time, not including uh, basic training or AIT, is considered a veteran for Massachusetts uh, and qualifies for all the programs and services at that point. Um, so it's really good. I think it, it goes for us here in Massachusetts is reaching out to the National Guard units and the reserve bases and doing a, a briefings with them, uh, letting them know. Because a lot of times when we speak to them, wow, I didn't know there was a welcome home bonus, which there is. It's a, it's a thousand dollar bonus tax free for any veteran who serves overseas, and then five hundred for each subsequent bonus. To this day, I'm still filling out those forms for veterans who deployed six, seven, ten years ago because they knew nothing of it, and it, it, it's spreading through word of mouth. Um, so again, it's really just getting out in the community and, 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 and forums just such as this and working with our legislators to get the information out to, to all the veterans of Massachusetts. So veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as current service members, uh, they have elevated rates of some like, common mental health issues. Uh, we're talking about depression, binge drinking, PTSD. Um, so what, what are we doing at the state and local level to make sure that uh, people coming home have access to mental health services? Um, and you can start this one off. Uh, just for starters, the recognition. A, a lot of people don't realize that service members, whether it be PTS, TBI, when we talk about what's going on at the VA in Boston with the TBI and the misplacing and those not processing those claims, right? And absolutely. Sorry, for, for, our, for our viewers, TBI? Uh, traumatic brain injury. Okay. Uh, one of the biggest, I mean, I would probably argue beginning to, and I would defer to you, potentially surpassing PTSD in terms of the number of service members who are struggling with that. Um, the recognition, substance abuse. And a lot of these, they're, so someone will be suffering from substance abuse, but also mental health issues. And it's just recognizing that. And one of the things that, and this is something that I talk to current veterans and service members about all the time, is there's still a stigma. There's still a stigma in the services about coming forward with some of these things because the concern is you have a lot of service members who want to stay in. And those of us who are still in do a much better job of destigmatizing that because what's happening right now is a service member might not come forward. They might not say, hey, I'm struggling with something that I saw downrange in Iraq and Afghanistan. I need help because their concern is that they might then get processed out because for a long time period we were downsizing the military and now we're back. So, but, I mean, what, what is the procedure in the military? Like, if you present with depression or PTSD, like, will, do they force you to get a medical discharge? How does that work? No, we've changed. I mean, do you want to get into these exact yeah, procedures? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I haven't, I've been out. Uh, some years I know they've they've changed that now where you know you can seek help uh, and it's confidential and, and no one needs to know and as a matter of fact I, I actually saw a, a Facebook video actually about three days ago it was a command sergeant major enlisted 20 plus years in the service he's given a speech and he's talking about how he came out with his PTSD issues from six deployments and how stupid he was, and he quoted himself saying this, that he never seeked help earlier. And he's urging everybody else who, who's suffering, seek the help. You know, there's no re repercussions in the military for seeking the help. It's all confidential. Um, so that's, that's uh, to the audience and the veterans. There's plenty of help out there. We just need to know that you need the help. We, if we don't know, we can't help you. And is that a big culture change from the way that the military was 10, 20 years ago? 100%, 100%, still a lot of work to do. The, the other area this comes up a lot too is 
well, for example, when I came back from Afghanistan, you're, you're, and I'm sure it was the same when you came back from Iraq, you have, you have a lot of questions. You know, what did you see over there? One of the questions, point blank, is did you see dead bodies? Well, I mean, you say yes, you raise your hand, um, a process could start, a process that could slow down a lot of the other things you're doing. One of the real big issues is security clearances. So when you have to renew your security clearance, whether it's just a regular clearance or a top secret one, some of the questions asked are, you know, have you been treated for anything, any mental health stuff, anything like that? And there are a lot of service members who are absolutely petrified that if they come forward that they're going to lose their clearance. And if you lose your clearance, you're out of the service. So has it been destigmatized a lot? I think it has. We're certainly moving in the right direction. But service members need to come forward if they have an issue. And it's up to those of us who are decision makers to make it make it. So, yeah, so if, <coughs> go ahead, sorry, go ahead. So Senator, oh, yeah. let, let, let's talk like legislatively. Yeah. What is it sort of like on the agenda? Is it something that's been addressed in the last few years on Beacon Hill? What are we talking about? Yeah, I mean, so it, so it is on the agenda. It should be even, I think I would, we would argue that it should be even more front and center. I mean, I've, I've observed it um, just, um, you know, as an, I, I'm not a veteran myself, but observing in the community, it does, there does seem to be a movement, a culture movement towards embracing and opening up uh, the ability to talk about these issues publicly. I mean, I remember just as a, a little kid, my uh, great uncle was a POW in, uh, in, in Europe in World, from World War II, and he never spoke about it. Uh, and in fact, it wasn't until after he, he died, 50 years later, uh, that, um, you know, we uncovered all of the, you know, all of the uh, citations and the, and the records from really the, the awful experience he had. And he had, you know, two kids who barely knew as well, and he, he really suffered with, with that for a long time. So I think a lot of this is cultural. It's not really, um, it's not through legislation, but through culture changes that have to happen. But there have been some successful programs. One is support for better and more peer-to-peer counseling. So one veteran talking to another veteran. That research has really shown um, that that's one of the most effective ways because you could have the best trained social worker or, or caseworker in the world who's, who's, who's got, who is up on every single possible theory and, and, um, and has decades of experience, but if they can't make a personal connection over what that veteran saw or where they were or what they did, it often doesn't, um, it doesn't prove effective. So what we've seen is even lay, lay counselors, you know, um, people who don't have professional um, psychiatric or social worker training, but who are just vets themselves who have gotten over it or gone out, come out the other side and get some just basic training about how to talk to someone, how to, how to conduct a, you know, a, um, you know, a peer-to-peer counseling session. It's very effective. And it's frankly not very expensive. Uh, it's, it's not very expensive to, to do those programs, but they're very effective and they give peop- they give returning vets a peer and someone who's been through it uh, the chance to talk it over in a safe environment um, and with someone who they can feel a sense of uh, relatedness to. We, we have an absolute gem here in Western Massachusetts in the vet center, yeah. and, it, and it's just that, yeah, exactly. peer-to-peer training. And, and, I guess the, and I could not agree more with what the senator just said. It, it is very difficult to talk to a civilian, if you will, about you know what your thoughts were when you saw your buddy's vehicle hit an IED. It's very difficult to talk to a civilian layperson or a civilian psychiatrist, if you will. But if you're talking to a battle buddy who's seen that as well, uh, it goes a lot more. So that peer-to-peer training, is, uh, peer-to-peer counseling, if you will, is unbelievable. And that's uh, and just to add, is, and, and that's why we we highly recommend that veterans seek assistance at the vet center. Uh, vet centers all for all combat veterans uh, and their families. They do counseling for their families as well. Uh, but it's also going to the VA system because a, a veteran who's suffering from, from PTSD sees a civilian doctor. A civilian doctor may not understand and may prescribe them something that they shouldn't be prescribing, that if they went to a vet center or the VA facility, it would be a different course of action. And I don't know the statistics, and I couldn't, I'm just saying from my personal opinion, this may be the reason why some uh, service members are now addicted to certain drugs or or go through alcoholism or whatever is because they probably saw that civilian physician who prescribed them something to help them sleep better at night and it spiraled. That's why the VA is trained, uh, and, and, and John can, can add to this, but the VA is trained for these and they're trying to do more counseling uh, and, and other alternatives than the prescription. And we're, we're hoping that that 
that is where the change comes now. Well, so following up on that, um, I know that, you know, 2015, 2016, there was a big national outcry over the way the VA was processing medical complaints. Uh, I mean, this might, you know, it's not limited to Massachusetts, but there was a massive wait list, um, and this got national attention. In the last couple of years, like, how would you rate the performance of, like, the federal VA system? Because, you know, the state does a lot, but obviously, like, any sort of better... We're system, all state. <laughs> uh, hey, no, it's, but it's a very important That's why I'm asking you guys. Yeah, like, the exactly. state and local communities can do a lot, but if a veteran needs to go to the VA precarious you're dealing with the federal government. So, like, you know, you're on the ground. Like, are you still getting complaints about that? Like, how, how would you say they're handling it? So, um... John Collins, Colonel Collins, uh, just, uh, he's probably been about two years now. He, he took over the VA in the Central West. He's improved the system a lot. Um, every VA facility is going to be specific to their area, and, and we're so fortunate to have the leadership that we have in Western Central Mass VA. Um, there's always going to be an issue. There's always going to be a vet that falls through a crack for some reason. We know this, and... Um, the outreach that the VA facility and their staff has with us on this panel and, and, and through all the VSOs is we can pick up the phone call and say, hey, I had a vet come in this morning and he got turned away for whatever reason, and it gets remedied right away. Um, Did so, it always used to be like that? No. Is this an improvement? No, this is, this is a, a big improvement. Okay. Um, and I, knew, I, I, I believe um, that uh, the VA system has just published, it's an online where you can actually see actual wait times now, I'm not sure, it, it's, it's fairly new, but you can actually go online and see what the wait times are for, uh, for specific appointments, um, and, and they've improved a lot, I, I gotta give them credit, this is all I use is the VA system, uh, yeah, I've had some hiccups with it, um, as to anything, but I, I, I think they're working on it, and, and they're getting there. Yeah, um, it's interesting. I, 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 my dad goes to the VA for his health care. My, my sister actually separately is a, is a clinical psychologist and she's worked with the VA both in Connecticut and in, and in Massachusetts. You know, I think we, we're lucky in a way in Western Mass because we have leads. Um, and, uh, and I think one of the lessons from the problems on the federal level is if you, if you localize some of the decision making more where, 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 where the providers are closer to the community, they're closer to the direct, the direct providers and the VSOs like Eric, um, you, you get better outcomes because they're just more nimble and they can be more responsive. Um, one great model we actually have in Massachusetts is we have a unique setup with these fusion kind of federal uh, and state facilities that are more, more locally controlled and locally managed. One great example is the Holyoke Soldiers Home. So Holyoke Soldiers Home relies on a big, a big amount of money from the federal government every year, but it also, um, its management and its, uh, and its board and its superintendent is appointed by the state, by the governor, and there's a substantial state investment in that home as well. And as a result, they're very responsive to the community, uh, and they do a great job, and it's, um, uh, and, uh, and um, you know, as Eric said, there's always issues we, you know, you don't want to paint a completely rosy picture because you always want to be working to improve. But I do think the lesson from that is often more local control, closer to the community, where it's more responsive, uh, where you can pick up the phone and call the doctor or call the hospital administrator or call the, um, you know, the home superintendent and they're, they're quick because they live in the community with you too and they want to make sure that their neighbors are being cared for. It's when you get into these very abstract, like far away bureauc bureaucracies where everything's a number um, and everything is a, is, a, is a dollar and cents figure that you run into big problems like you, like you, you had with the federal, you know, the, with the central VA for the last few years. Access to care. So, if you were to ask, I think a lot of veterans, and I've—that's who I go to for my health care. And I've in Northampton, Weeds has been great, absolutely great. Um, to Eric's point, I, I think it depends on what VA you're talking about. It's very inconsistent throughout the country. Um, what we do need to get better at, and we absolutely have gotten better at it, when people present with certain symptoms, if you will. Uh, whether it be they're threatening to do harm to themselves or others, something like that, there needs to be protocols in place, and there are, but we can have zero room for uh, mishaps in this area, mistakes. Someone presents, again, post-traumatic, some of the traumatic brain injury stuff. We need to capture them if we have to, to bring them into the system. 
that's what, to a certain degree, we, there's still always going to be room for improvement. I'm talking about nationally, but a lot of it is there's the access to compare, and then there's the, and then there's the care itself. There, you're going to talk to a lot of veterans who are going to say the care that they have once they're in the system has been phenomenal. You know, when you're talking about your dental work and just run of the mill medical stuff, if you will. But it's when we get into some of those conditions that need immediate an immediate response. That's where we still need some more improvement, and there has been improvement recently. Um, so, I mean, when we're talking about mental health and veterans, like, I think that obviously leads to the question of veteran homelessness. Uh, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development estimates that about 40,000 of the 18 million veterans in the United States uh, are homeless on any given night. Um, I mean, this is an issue that, like, you know, we see it when we write about homelessness in mass life. Like, people are always asking, what, are you, what is being done for the homeless veterans? It's, that strikes a chord because you have these people who you know, enlisted, who made sacrifices, and then to have them end up on the street um, seems like a kind of particular injustice. Uh, so what, where are we at in Massachusetts in terms of addressing this question? I mean, you know, there's always people, uh, I think nationally with very good intentions, talking a big game about reducing this number to zero. Right. It's very difficult in any public policy problem to reduce the number to zero, as I'm sure you guys know. Um, <laughs> Be but, very suspicious if somebody right, is making yeah, that claim. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I mean, what like what what can we do? What is being done? Um, and like, where are some of the deficiencies there? Um, and I guess uh, I don't know if you deal with this personally. Uh, uh, I have. Uh, we we actually I, I sit on a, a committee that that. Uh, deals a lot with veterans homelessness and, and how we can provide services. The state is is wonderful at providing the financing if we need it. As VSOs, anytime we're presented with a homeless veteran, uh, any services that we provide that ho homeless veteran or their family, it's 100% reimbursable to the city and town. So there should be no excuse by any VSO in the state of Massachusetts not to assist the homeless family. You have to, you're being reimbursed. 100% of whatever you provide this, this veteran and this family. Um, and then we have other organizations, Soldier On here in Western Mass as well, uh, and across the state, and you have the bilingual veteran centers with, their, with, the, with the, the housing unit that they have. Um, I got the numbers. It, uh, right now, Western Mass and the four counties are 267 chronically homeless veterans. Um, so when we say we want to end veterans' homelessness, we can, and we, we probably did. It's the chronically homeless, the ones that have been on the street for a long period of time. Uh, they get assistance, and for some, you know, I, I think it's, and I think we spoke about this, it's the follow-through on all the other benefits um, and services. So once you put them into a temporary housing or permanent housing, it's to follow up with them to make sure they're getting the right counseling, the right health uh, benefits, and, and the financing through the 115 program or whatever it is to keep them housed. Um, and you know you got uh, great organizations like Homewood Vets. You know we provide them a, a place to live. You know we put them in an apartment, but they have nothing, no furniture, no household goods, no. So Homewood Vets steps in. They provide. You know we have a warehouse in Ludlow, and the veteran can go in there and open up and uh, and and pick you know sofas, whatever whatever they want, and the truck loads it and takes it to the. So now we're giving them something that they can call home. So you're not just giving them an apartment; you're giving them their home. Uh, and then the counseling starts. That's where the counseling comes in, and, and the VA facility, and, and Bond Street, and the Vet Center. Everybody, need, we need to, uh, and we sit on this this committee that we try to bring all the services together at the round at the at the at the table, so that to make sure that the veteran A did he see you, did he see you, did he see you? Yes, yes, yes. And that's how we will end veterans homelessness, not just throwing them into an apartment. Yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly right, and, and um, that's the model, and that's what needs to be replicated um, across the state is, you know, you have right now, the resources are there, but they're disparate, and what you need is this community-based coalition model where a phone call comes in and everyone mobilizes. You've got folks working on the housing, on the support services, on the counseling, on food assistance, um, and, uh, and, that, and that's the model that we need to replicate. It's a management challenge to make sure that that's the same experience whether you're in Western Mass or Central Mass or Southeastern Mass. One state that's actually done a good job and frankly has done a better job than us is Virginia. Uh, and we've done a little bit of work looking at Virginia's model. They entered a, a pretty aggressive partnership with, with HUD and the federal VA, federal HUD, Housing and Urban Development, and federal VA. 
um, and their state uh, veteran and, and housing services. And they, it's never going to be zero, but it, they got they basically got uh, their homeless uh, veterans issues to the to you know just where Eric is saying, which is that when the phone call comes in, they the resources are there and they know how to and they know how to handle it. So you know the Virginia model is one we can study and, and one we can try to replicate and mimic here. Um, and uh, you know they, they, these these organizations deserve immense credit uh, because you know honestly we can we can write laws and we can give speeches until you know until we're blue in the face, but without community support and without partners on the ground who have like you know legitimacy and trust in the community, uh, you, you can't do anything. So um, you know they, it's really those groups. You know, Soldier are an amazing. Uh, amazing organizations that just do incredible work every day. I, I really view our role in the legislature as having their back and just supporting their their work so that they can they can get out there and do it. So, Repulous, um, ha have you noticed this kind of in inconsistency uh, that Senator Lester and Mr. Scooter were talking about? Where, you know, if you're a veteran in a certain town and you're homeless, you might have a very different experience than if you're in somewhere that's better resourced. Um, is that is that something that you guys are paying attention to? Is it something that's common in Massachusetts? The the best VSOs, veteran service officers, like Eric, um, they view it to be more than a job. It's when they get that claim, when they're processing that paperwork, when it gets to be five o'clock, they're not leaving until that process. The number of times I've talked to this gentleman at 10 p.m. and he's still working, processing a claim, and unfortunately, there are some VSOs, in my opinion, please correct me if I'm wrong, who view it as a job. They check in, they check out. And there's nothing wrong with that. A job is a job, and they want to get home to their lives. But I would just suggest a little bit that, you know, for our vets, again, we need to go above a little bit, above and beyond a little bit. So, yeah, I am seeing, unfortunately, I am seeing, depending on what town, what city you live in, there are just a several, there's just a broad array of type of services, not necessarily services, but the individual VSO, how far they go in terms of their advocacy. Am I wrong? Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, it, 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 the numbers are very low, but it affects us, it, it affects us across the state because if, if I get a call and the veterans from another town, but they called me, I'm not going to say, well, you're not from my town, and hang. I help them as much as I can, try to get them in contact with, with their VSO. But if it's an emergency situation, we call that the state has a great save team, a uh, statewide advocacy group. These are men and women on the ground for emergency situations. I've gotten phone calls Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. They're there within an hour, right at the front door, whether it's the police station, wherever there's veterans in need, the save team is there. The state has put great resources in place. Again, it's, the, it's, it's a front line, the VSO, that connects all these services. So when that VSO in that community is not doing what is expected of them to do, it's a chain reaction. Absolutely. It's a chain reaction from that veteran getting services to not getting services. Uh, well, I wanted to thank all three of you for participating today. I think it was a good conversation. Um, so we're going to sign off. Thanks for tuning in.